All right, guys, welcome to another stream today. I'm joined by Dr. Avi, who is a vegan doctor, who's with me today to discuss the C vaccines and shots and just go back and forth with a lot of relevant questions that a lot of you guys have asked me and that seems really prevalent in the mainstream public and also in the vegan community as well. So first question for you, Avi, and thank you for joining us today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and also your stance on the corona shots. Sure. So I'm a vegan medical doctor. Um, I joined the plant-based movement uh, several years ago. And uh, in terms of my stance on the coronavirus uh, shots um, or vaccines, uh, as I would call them, um, I am overwhelmingly in favor of them. Uh, I think they are, I think it's one of the most amazing feats of technology that we are able to, uh, in the amount of time that we're able to do it, uh, get these, get such a technology out in the face of a global pandemic. And I encourage people to utilize such technology so that we can uh, get back to normal in various parts of the world. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. So the first question, I guess, for me is more of a vegan related one. And mm -hmm. I remember being sent a clip and I, and I watched the interview. I think it was a panel with you and other vegan doctors for the COVID vaccine. And yeah. I think you mentioned in the stream how in your opinion, the vaccines can be considered vegan or vegans should consider taking it because um, the animals tested mm -hmm. on were less of, you know, of less sentience, I believe you, you made the argument for. And also... So uh, just to... Wait, wait, let me just interrupt you right there, John. So sure. the argument the argument wasn't over... So here was the argument. It wasn't just that the animals were less sentient, so okay. it's okay. The argument was that first and foremost... There's no additional demand that's created by you taking the vaccine because the testing was already done. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you didn't take the vaccine, it leaves open a pool of unvaccinated individuals that other pharmaceutical companies are going to look at. And they're going to see, oh, there's this proportion of individuals that aren't vaccinated. Let's try to get our FDA approval. And when they do that, that's guess what? That actually means more testing, right? So a very plausible argument could make, not only does it not create demand for more animal testing, but if you don't get vaccinated, if a whole bunch of people don't get vaccinated, it may actually create incentives for more animal testing paradoxically to actually occur. That was point number one. Okay. Point number two, that, okay, so that's the first point. The second point that I made in terms of the lower sentience was that even if that point doesn't go through, which it does, but even if that point doesn't go through, the in my the second point wasn't even the sentience point it was just the numbers even if you just consider all life to be of equal value you're talking about um testing on the amount of lives you're talking about testing on comparing amount of lives you're talking about saving the proportions are just astronomically imbalanced and so mm -hmm. even if point number one somehow didn't go through point number two would go through which is just the absolute numbers. And then point number three is if you consider the sentience, it would be even, even more than that. So what I'm doing is I'm making an overdetermination. So mm -hmm. just like someone charges someone for murder and, man, and uh, theft and everything to get them in jail no matter what, I'm, the point I'm bringing here is that regardless of what argument you're going with, there's another argument that's not on the way. So it's funny because a lot of people just heard the sentience part and that's what they picked out of that segment. <laughs> and it's really weird that that like they just completely forgot everything I said before. Sure. And so if, for everyone listening, even if you don't consider sentience differentials to be relevant, the argument is that's not even the main argument. Mm -hmm. The main argument is that you could very well be causing more animal testing by not getting the vaccine than by getting it. Right. Well, that's considering the idea that that animal testing phase is necessary, right? Which I think a lot of vegans are arguing against. No, it's not. So here's the thing. Even if it's not necessary, it's, it's necessary to get into the market. It's not necessary. Okay. Well, right. the word necessary well it could, it could be an alternative way of getting into market, so to speak. Well, not the markets that they're trying yeah. to make profits right. off of. If you're talking about the U.S. market, I can tell you right now, they're not, you're not going to get into it without an animal testing. Right. Unfortunately, and it's un I want to repeat, it's yeah. unfortunate, sucks that it's like yeah. that, 
but the prime, the way pharmaceutical industries by and large work is they want to get into profitable markets. That's just the name of the game. Um, and the most profitable markets are right now, USA. That's mm -hmm. where you can, that's where you end up making the most bang for your buck. I can tell you the FDA will never approve a vaccine without, or any pharmaceutical, virtually any pharmaceutical for that matter, without some form of animal testing. And so yeah. it's, is it necessary from a scientific perspective, John? No, it's not. Is it necessary to get into the market for the FDA to approve it? Yes, mm -hmm. for that market it is. And that's why it's your, the argument goes through it's because you're, you could very well just incentivize another company right. to see that unvaccinated population and want to reap those rewards. Sure. And as a, as a vegan, you're, I don't know if you consider yourself a vegan or not, but um, you know, as a vegan- I do. Okay, for ethical reasons, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. You know, you, you were talking a lot about numbers, how um, one animal sacrifice would save around 7,000 um, people or something mm -hmm. like that, right? And it's an underestimate, by the way. Yeah, see, sure. it's even more than that. Sure. Yeah. But let's assume, you know, the, the tables turn and, and, and we had a situation where, you know, in order to save, um, you know, 7,000 animals, 150 you know, humans had to die and be tested on. How would you see yeah. that as opposed to what you're saying with um, your argument? Yeah, so at some threshold, the answer would be yes. I don't know if the threshold might not exactly be the same because of, I do consider a sentience differential to be part of it. So the numbers would have, may have to scale up more. But to answer your question, yes, I would take a consistent approach. Um, in principle, at some level, at some threshold differential level, I would say yes to that question as well. So just a general question, like in general, just so I have an idea where you stand, um, you know, in the in terms of the industry in general, you know, do you personally believe that there is, you know, corruption and industrial influence, political influence that leads to conflicts of interest when it comes to these particular shots, um, you know, in relation to organizations that are recommending and pushing the shots, such as the NIH, FDA, CDC, and WHO, for example? I haven't been aware of any evidence of corruption in NIH, CDC, and, and those organizations. If you're asking me with respect to the pharmaceutical industries themselves, um, look, there's always going to be motivations to make profit. If you're talking about um, corruption, I'm not sure what you mean. If you mean something other than motivations to make profit, or you're talking about um, like lying and stuff like that. Yeah. I, what I can tell you is that, yeah, so I haven't, I haven't been aware of any like evidence that there were any overt lies, but what I can tell you is Pharmaceutical companies are no different than any other company. Their goal is to make a profit. That doesn't mean that the thing they're selling is a bad thing, though. Like you, like an air conditioning company's goal is to make a profit, too. But in the hot summer, it's still a very good thing to have an air conditioning and to cool your house. Uh, a farmer's goal is to make a profit. You can buy their food. It's not a bad thing. Like just because someone's goal is to make a profit doesn't mean that they're selling something that's bad. That should just be judged by the data. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that, that's the overarching kind of idea that, you know, if there is a financial incentive, if there, if there are conflicts of interest, the data can then be manipulated in favor of the interest, right? And so the data is amazing. Like, I'm super pro-science. I love science. But there's always some influence that is going, always a motivation behind something. And as, as you probably have seen in the news, like um, even Tony Fauci's email leaks and, uh, or and not, it wasn't even a leak, it was just, um, you know, a release, um, does, you know, bring a lot of questions to the table when it comes to, you know, the, the CDC and the NIH and also WHO and these things uh, regarding well, many things that we can discuss, but, um, you know, there, there are many. Well, just, you know, just before we get to that, before we get to that, um, yeah. so. I just want to give you an, a picture of what would happen in terms of like, um, in terms of the randomized control trial data being suspect. The degree of conspiracy that would have to happen um, is astronomical, and I'll tell you why. Because this, these were multi-center uh, international trials yep. with numerous different hospitals and numerous different out, in both inpatient and outpatient centers collecting patients and collecting data. And the data goes to the sponsor through those different sites. Now, for that data to be fabricated to the degree that it would change things measurably, you would have to have a conspiracy 
involving many different sites, all coordinated with each other, changing the data in such a way. Also, you would have to have all the um, all the ecological data that came afterwards, all the retrospective data for different uh, hospitals to somehow also be in cahoots with them to match that data. Because guess what? It's not just the randomized controlled trial that showed these things. It's also the observations of other independent organizations that have done population studies in various different countries that have found the same thing. So you would, you would have to be an international multi-center uh, both intra and international conspiracy. And you would have to have it done for various different pharmaceutical companies all doing in both intra and international conspiracy for that to happen. Mm -hmm. That's what just to just to it's not just an organization being having some corruption. Like you would have to have like one of the greatest conspiracy theories in the history of mankind for this to work. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And, and you're talking specifically about uh, which, which trials are you talking about now, like the, the ongoing human trials? So I'm talking about so I'm talking about the Pfizer phase three, okay. um, phase three uh, randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. I'm talking also about the Moderna phase three randomized control trial. I'm also talking about the non-trial data, which is the observational data that's been done in various different countries, mm -hmm. well, including countries that are not part of the West. Right. Right. And, and so which it, which markers and which, um, you know, what was control for in the human trials that you're talking about that shows the safety sure. and efficiency of, of the injection? Sure. So it's a randomized control trial. So they gave the placebo to uh, a group of individuals and then they gave the real vaccine to a group of individuals. Um, it's the actual uh, numbers. So. The, in Pfizer specifically, it was 21,000 apiece. Um, so 21,000 individuals received a placebo injection and 21,000 individuals uh, approximately received uh, the actual vaccine. And then they were followed over time. Um, Do you know how long? Um, the, well, so the, I see the data here going up to 119 days. Um, so, but the, there's been longer term follow-up data after that. What I can tell you is that I can like do it with my hands. If you, over that amount of time, like if you look at the divergence between how many people are getting COVID or not, it just goes like this. Um, to a great degree, to a point to where it's like 20 times more likely for someone to get COVID if they don't get the vaccine compared to getting the vaccine. It's not even, uh, it's not even close. Right. Um, and the, and the placebo group was was also studied for the equal length of time to the control group. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So there wasn't like an unblinding process of the placebo group. No, not during the duration that I'm talking about. Eventually, when there was um, EUA, when when there was an emergency use, use authorization, that mm -hmm. placebo group. Um, they're allowed. You can't like tell people like, hey, listen, like everyone's getting authorized to get this vaccine for emergency use. You're not allowed to, though. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes unethical because once you've demonstrated how good it is and how safe it is, it's to prohibit someone from getting the vaccine at that point in time. It wouldn't be ethical. So most people yeah. in, in the placebo group ended up choosing to get it. However, what we do have is we have the data prior to the EUA. We have the data from before there was emergency use authorization, and we can follow the placebo group and the, uh, and the vaccine group over that time where mm -hmm. the time is equal, and, the, and we can see what happens to both of them when there is no crossover. And it's very clear. Um, and and how, how, how do these trials measure the, the efficiency or efficacy? What are the metrics sure. used? So, yeah, yeah, so the, the metrics of measuring efficacy is based on uh, how many cases of COVID that uh, of symptomatic COVID that has been uh, observed in the placebo group and the control group? So they do it by events. So they have the end, the ends of the ends are the number of people in the study. Those are equal in the placebo group and the vaccine group. Right. And the events per uh, group are events of symptomatic COVID. Now, some trials break it down further in terms of severe COVID, like events that will lead you to hospitalization, 
uh, some will break it down to like mild, moderate COVID. In any case, they all show the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. For all these different categories, it's, it's a much, much stronger chance that you will get hospitalized for COVID or develop symptomatic COVID if you do not get the vaccine than if you get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that is shown through a PCR test to, to show the events, right? That's shown through either. Um, so PC, it could be PCR. Um, I'm not sure if all of them are PCR. Some may be rapid antigen tests, but I believe at this time frame, rapid antigen tests weren't as popular. So I believe this would be PCR. Okay. In the majority of cases, yeah. Okay. And hopefully they, they use the same cycle threshold for, for everyone across the board. Sure. Uh, ho yes. But even if they also, even if they don't, here's the thing. Even if there was variability of cycle thresholds, the degree of difference that you would have to have in order to make these results different, you would, again, you would have to have a systematic bias that would be so great that it would basically um, require an a inter and international conspiracy. Right. Like, the, the, I, can't ex I can't stress enough how, okay, so remember like we talk about relative risks, John, we talk about relative risks of like 1.3, 1 1.6, 1 two point something. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like to say rel you need a relative risk of two or over for it to be meaningful. You know, all those memes. Yeah. This relative risk came out to be 20 something, mm -hmm. right? 20 something higher fold increased risk of getting COVID if you don't get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for that magnitude, in order for that to be affected by a cycle threshold difference, you would basically have to have a, a mass conspiracy. Like you, you, there would have to be something so, I can't stress enough, like we don't see, um, and we only, by the way, we only see these kind of efficacies really so far through this new technology. If you look at the other vaccines that just use antigen adjuvant technologies, they get efficacy of 70, 80 percent, not 95, not mm -hmm. 90, 95. So this new technology, it's actually really amazing in terms of how well it works mm -hmm. to be able to take that, how, that magnitude of treatment effect of, or, or prevent, of prophylactic effect and to have it and to argue that there was some system, systematic bias, you would have to have such a great degree of an imbalance there. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why we randomize patients. The patients need to be, that's why we randomize them to the site. So even if one site does a different cycle threshold, they have different cycle thresholds for both the control group and the vaccine group mm -hmm. in, the same, in the same site. So that bot, those biases are gonna balance out. That's why we randomize people. Right, right. And, and as you mentioned, um, the, the, the injection was um, made like very hastily. Um, not that that impacts the quality or anything like that, but it was, um, you know, emergency authorized, not approved, right? In your opinion, we don't need the long, longer term data to prove its efficacy or, or safety um, of these particular um, drugs, right? At this, at this point, I don't think so, but there will be anyway. There will, will be, so they are still going to follow and they still are following people who have the vaccine, the various vaccines, and they are monitoring um, adverse events, but it, it's always, here's the thing, John, it's always a risk reward um, analysis, right? So you always have to ask what the, okay, so there's always going to be a risk of a certain pharmaceutical. You always have to match that up against the risk of COVID, mm -hmm. right? And so based on everything we know, um, and we can get into the risks of COVID for healthy individuals, healthy men, men such as you and I, John, mm -hmm. we can get into, because I don't think it's just, uh, just a, so, oh, you get COVID and, and, and that's it. There may be some long-term consequences mm -hmm. of getting COVID uh, that are quite substantial, and we can get into that as well. But based on the risk reward, I think the, the benefits vastly outweigh the risks, not even a question. Sure, sure. And, and obviously, like, as you've probably seen, uh, these drugs are also projected to be the most profitable injections um, to date as well. Um, and in the previous 
coronaviruses, um, you know, the animal tests and trials, they hadn't really succeeded. They hadn't really gotten the results they were looking after. And so why would it be different this time around when all the other animal trials for, uh, it wasn't, you know, SARS-CoV-2, but other coronaviruses have failed in terms of developing a, a vaccine for it? Well, one thing is that um, SARS-CoV-1 is, so as you said, it's a different virus. The other thing is there's not as, there wasn't as much incentive to make a medicine that works this way because, the, because SARS-CoV-1 just burned out. It didn't create a pandemic of this nature. And because it didn't create a pandemic of this nature, you didn't have as much incentive to make a technology that would fight this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Whenever, look, here's the thing, John, whenever you have a need for something, whenever there's a need that can be profitable, you're, more scientists are going to be put to work on it, more uh, technology is going to be put to work on it, and it's, the probability that it's going to succeed is just going to be higher. Mm -hmm. And so when you mention it's, it's the, you answer the question in your own question. It's, you, met, you said it's the most profitable, uh, one of the most profitable pharmaceuticals. Now, if that's true, it makes perfect sense why it would, why, um, it would be efficacious because so much, so much work has been put into this thing to make it so profitable. And I'm, by the way, good. I'm glad that it's profitable. I'm glad that a pandemic fighter happens to be profitable. If it wasn't pro the reason it's here, John, is because it's profitable. If it wasn't profitable, you wouldn't have it. We haven't studied SARS-CoV-2 for that long, right? And so how can we be sure of the long-term concerns, especially when we take into consideration all the anecdotal evidence, which is not the greater mm -hmm. form of evidence, and a lot of people dismiss that, such as the VAERS database and that kind of stuff. Um, people are reporting a lot of issues, and so people are concerned because of that um, due to the fact that the long-term data is lacking as well. And also, you sure. know, what, 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 you know, <laughs> what kind of markers are being tested for um, potential side effects, right? Like what is being tested pre-injection, post-injection to see if there is any, you know, a potential inflammation in your cardiovascular system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are, what is being done to be, to, to track this thing? So in terms of inflammation, we know there's going to be inflammation. The, the purpose, one of the, 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 the entire premise of the vaccine is going to cause some sort of inflammation. There's going to be some uh, interplay between the antigen and the immune cells that's going to release some cytokines. So if you're asking, well, are we checking to see if there's inflammation? Of course not. We know there's going to be inflammation. The entire purpose is to have some in in inflammation. That's part of the therapy. That's part of the, the, the prophylactic mechanism. Um, in term, but what we do re look at is um, what has been looked at is symptoms pre and post. Um, and uh, the data, if I, again, uh, screen sharing doesn't seem to be available, but um, the safety, based on the safety data um, that has been looked at, there were two uh, vaccine recipients out of a uh, out of, uh, total of uh, 21,669 uh, that uh, passed away during the, uh, the period of the study, one from atherosclerosis and one from cardiac arrest. Four people in the placebo group died two from unknown causes, one from a hemorrhagic stroke and one from a myocardial infarction, and no deaths were, be, were related to the vaccine placebo. So it's important to know here. So, so number one, the, the, you had two people die in the vaccine group and four people die in the, in the control group. Um, so is, it, is anything related to anything? Probably not. But if anything, um, there were more deaths. It is worth pointing out, there were more deaths in the placebo group than the control group, right? Um, double the deaths. Now, does that make, is that anything statistically significant? Probably not, because you're looking at two, two, uh, two and four. The risk, the numbers are so small, but if you want to get technical about it, the point estimate is actually going to be on the side favoring the vaccine for safety in, from the period of the randomized control trial. In terms of long-term safety follow-up, again, that question is going to apply to both the coronavirus and in terms of the vaccine itself. Based on uh, our follow-ups data so far, we're not seeing anything that seems to be very con uh, seems to be very concerning for long-term follow-up from for neither Pfizer nor uh, Moderna, um, mm -hmm. especially in compared to the coronavirus itself. 
coronavirus itself, we're see- that's, that's something where we actually are seeing emerging long-term uh, consequences coming up that actually are not just anecdotes that have been uh, shown in, uh, co- in uh, cohort data, as well as ha- having mechanistic support. Mm-hmm. And we can get into that as well. But, th- but that's actually something where we are seeing, where we are seeing long-term safety issues, we are seeing it with getting COVID. Well, it's been a year, right? So it's not that long term yet, right? So it's been a little more. It's been a little more in the year, but yeah, yeah. Um, it's been uh, since like well February last last year. So we're almost at a we're almost at right. a year and a half. Sure, but and, but that's and, that's enough. That's enough time to see. That's enough time to see. That's why we're seeing more and more things. But I'm just saying the things that we're seeing pop up mm-hmm. are not on the vaccine side. The things that we are seeing pop up in terms of the longer term consequences. We're seeing them on the COVID side. How do you think doctors can treat patients with COVID in the hospital or even, you know, when testing positive if they have not had the vaccine? So certain, a lot of drugs have been proposed. Um, a lot of them have shown not to really work. Um, so I'll tell you what, what has been shown to be somewhat promising and what has not been shown to be promising. Um, medications that have not been shown to be promising ha- include ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, those medications have not been shown to be promising. Um, in what way? The, in what way? In, in the sense of, both in, terms of um, both in terms of mortality and in terms of morbidity, in terms of being able to get out of the hospital quicker, in terms of death, um, they just what haven't data, been able to show. You know the, what the data is? Um, let's, let's just take hydroxychloroquine as an example. What data are you referring yeah. to right now? There's, I'm referring to multiple different randomized controlled trials that have been published, both using it as a prophylactant and in terms of a treatment in the hospital. So the best data, because some people with hydroxychloroquine, when they say, well, it's not early enough, there's a randomized controlled trial that actually gave them uh, at the earliest signs, in fact, even potentially before, uh, they gave them hydroxychloroquine. No difference in terms of hospitalization, no difference in terms of the, uh, the, the rate of getting COVID, no difference in terms of getting out of the hospital. Um, trial, this has been put to death. This has been like the, the nails in the coffin of these medications have been just already nailed quite a while ago. Okay. What has been shown to be more effective is there are certain um, monoclonal antibodies that have been developed um, like banlambizumab or whatnot, and they have there's some data uh, indicating that they may be somewhat helpful, um, but it's tough. I mean, you need there still needs to be um, follow up. And oh, oh, sorry, another thing that hasn't really been shown that was promising was um, convalescent plasma. So we had uh, some high hopes for convalescent plasma, and that's the idea that well, people who had COVID can donate their plasma and they have antibodies there. But it turns out that wasn't really very helpful. It didn't really show, it didn't really pan out and it, and it didn't really help people who had COVID-19. So <clears throat> unfortunately, a lot of promising therapies that we, that we hyped up and thought that they were good, it turns out they didn't really work, which is all the more reason to not get this virus in the first place, Sure. right? If, there, if treatment after treatment has been not effective and there may be some like handful of treatments that have shown some promise in trials, but are very expensive and whatnot, and they're systemic, just don't get the virus. Right. Well, let, let's, you know, for example, let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. It's, um, mm-hmm. it's something that sure. a lot of people where, you know, patient or um, uh, doctors, frontline doctors were using early on, right, in a lot of places in the U.S., yeah. many places around the world, um, even in combination with, I don't know, <laughs> a ton of different it's um, dithromycin. They used the combination with the dithromycin. Yeah, ivermectin, fibrofibrillar, you know, yep. oxycycline, antimalarial yep. mal- steroids, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, yeah. And yep. because it was like there was no guidance, there was no uh, consensus on how mm-hmm. to deal with this, a lot of these doctors were, you know, just trying whatever they could, right, to save lives. And yeah. you know, a lot of doctors and clinics actually saw a lot of uh, promising results with let's use, um, you know, hydroxychloroquine, right? Which you're saying is disproven by, you know, a randomized control trial. Maybe you're talking about- um, yeah. Multiple, yeah. multiple randomized control trials. Right, yeah. maybe it's not, not the only recovery has trials or the solidarity trials, for example, right? There, there's been more than that, but the, the, not only has it been disproven, John, 
if anything, they were actually harming patients. So if you, so one thing that they were doing is they were giving hydroxychloroquine with, um, with azithromycin. And if you look at the results for that, for those trials, for that arm, um, they actually had a higher risk of dying. Right. Uh, than at hospitalized got, patients, right? Yeah. 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 They had a higher risk of higher risk. You had a higher, and, and they were, look, these doctors, and by the way, these are, these are often the same doctors that will tell you how promising their results are. And this is why it's important to do a trial and not just, not just listen to doctors saying they've seen these promising results. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, they were killing people. Right. In reality, they, were, they had good intentions. They're not bad people. They had sure. great intentions. And they were just focusing on the patients that got better. Right. But in reality, they were just making it more likely for them to die. Right. Well, in the trials from what, what I've read um, as well, let's use the uh, solidarity and um, the recovery trials, which were the main ones that got the FDA to uh, retract the emergency approval, um, you know, to use that as a treatment for COVID. Um, you know, they were using it in hospitalized patients, which was not supposed to <laughs> happen as, as it's an outpatient, like an early treatment, right? Um, you know, what they've been doing and seeing a success with um, in clinics it was for early treatments, not for hospitalized patients yeah. who are on their deathbed. And also they were giving doses that were completely, you know, off the charts in terms of um, what they would normally use for other purposes um, that are shown to be effective in the last, whatever, 50, 60 years of... of well, there's, right? there's been trials. Yeah, there's been trials that looked at it early on. There's been trials that looked at early COVID. There's been trials that looked at it the prophylactic, the point being it's the earliest possible. Um, right. I don't yeah. recall the doses being off the chart, and they found the same thing. They found that it doesn't do anything. Right. Yeah, apparently the doses were like three to four times higher than, um, you know, <laughs> what they're supposed to be. So, um and, not and in, was, I'm not aware of that being the case. In okay. the, I'm not aware of being the case in the outpatient doses. But but either way, like here's the thing, John. Like you you do the trial, and all, there's always something that will be like, oh well, you did this. Okay, well no, it's not supposed to be in, in late stage. It's supposed to be early COVID. Oh okay, well we'll do the trial with early COVID. Oh well, the dosage that is a was a high dose. Though. Okay, well, the, wait, which which from which from which trial are you talking about? Uh, the recovery the and energy, the COVID, New England uh, German. No, no, no. I'm talking about new, the New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, from from the hydroxychloroquine prophylactic. Oh, uh, the the combination treatments. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. Standard dose is around like it could be around 400 to 600 milligrams as a single dose for two divided doses per day. Then it's 200 milligrams a day or 400. Like, these are standard doses for like uh, general indications of hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. But that's that's what was done in a randomized controlled trial as pre-exposure, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. So what they did was they had individuals that um, they had individuals that were um, uh, exposed to COVID, and when they were exposed to COVID, they gave them um, they gave them either placebo or hydroxychloroquine. They gave them 800 milligrams once, followed by 600 in six to eight hours, then 600 uh, daily for additional four days, mm -hmm. which is not that high of a dose. It's slightly higher, but it's not that crazy. It's not like off the charts. Um, and it did, it did absolutely nothing. Someone looks at the data and they look at the results, they look at the methodology, they look at everything, all the steps of the way, and you decide yeah. to you know, use that as truth, as fact, as you know, you know the answers because of that. So that is, you know, okay. So to be clear, to, to be clear, to John, all right. So let me let me just be clear. What I'm saying, and here's what you don't have to have faith. What I'm saying is that you don't have to have faith to believe that the extent of what the data is, to the extent that it is, uh, okay. is such that it the the results, uh, the conclusion that you're going to draw is going to be the same. So for example, yes, the data might be, you know, there might be an error in some site that they reported one event in, in another group rather than the first group. There might be some error in another site that balanced that out or so why not. The data might not be exactly the same, but the degree of how off it would have to be to make a huge difference like that, that you don't have to have faith because you would have to believe in something absolutely astronomically improbable in order for it to be that way. So you don't have to believe that the data is exactly the way it is in order to draw this conclusion. There's a whole range of possibilities of how the data can be, and the probability of it being something that would change your conclusion on that data is so is so low that you would actually have to have faith to not accept the results of the data, actually.
Right. Well, you know, the, the main idea here is just to be open-minded, right, to, to be critical of the data that it's showing, especially when it's funneled so, um, um, you know, selectively through, you know, a handful of organizations, especially when you're just considering the Moderna and Pfizer trials. And on top of that, considering that, you know, the, the side effects that are coming up, although they're anecdotal and, and a lot of people want to throw it out as garbage, we're still seeing a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who know people who've taken the shot, who've had, um, you know, severe consequences, although it's rare for sure, but it's not being shown in those randomized controlled trials. So there is like a contrast there, um, even in VAERS, which is not an accurate um, reporting system whatsoever, I believe. Um, it's still got, you know, in the last, whatever, a couple of months, it's gotten more death reports than all the other injections of the traditional um, vaccines combined for the last 20 years, right? So um, it's, it's still a huge spike in cases and reports. And so, I mean, and look, so, yeah, but, but, but John, here's, here's the thing. Like, yes, you should always have an open mind, but they, these are hypothesis generating things that should be put to the test in just like that randomized controlled trials. If you have those things, those anecdotes, and you do a randomized controlled trial and none of that pans out, then that supersedes the anecdotes, right? right? This is true in any context. We don't change our epistemic, our epistemic rules just because it's a vaccine and people are, like, you know, spamming the bears report system with anything that they're putting together and what they think happened. Um, so, yes, we'd be open. We should be open minded. But, of course, not to the point where our brains are on the floor. Right. But don't you think we should consider, you know, the possibility that there is more happening when all of a sudden, you know, this this reporting is exploded through the roof compared to any other time in history? Of course. And that's why we should that's why we should engage in randomized controlled trials and or rigorous studies to see it. Right. And every time we do that, it doesn't pan out. And it shows that actually these things either were not either coincidental or they were actually from COVID and you were attributing to, to the vaccine or something, or that, or, or uh, they were from something else, or they, or, or by the way, made up. That's another thing people do with bears, by the way. They literally are po political individuals sure. who are, who make spam accounts mm -hmm. with the bears and they make shit up. Not joking. Right. Yeah, um, you know, that, that's a possibility for sure. Um, but the issue is then, you know, when there are conflicts of interest, if the randomized controlled trials and most um, well-studied trials and well-developed trials are from the companies themselves and are not independent with, a, a, you know, a, a very um, large variety of experts from, you know, all sorts of backgrounds, countries, et cetera, you know, a lot of people end up asking questions if everyone um, is basing their opinion, their their recommendations based on the Moderna or the Pfizer trials that will benefit them if they have a positive result, right? John, this isn't just just isn't this idea that all the studies have just been filtered through the RCTs, the, 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 the pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, the RCTs. But again, like that's the case with every pharmaceutical. Like, why do you have like this degree of skepticism when it comes to a vaccine and not with any other medication on the planet? Like the sure. the uh, the pro see, yeah, like you, you under again, like the degree to which there's a lot of medications. Would have to be off. You'd have to agree that a lot of medicines, you know, are shown to have promising results in randomized controlled trials and then you know something horrible happens and they had to pull it off the market actually there's not actually if you look at proportionally it's a drop in the ocean i i have a, there's a list of right. drugs that, happens. uh are like that no 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 yes it does happen but the probability that it happens is very very even in those cases a lot of times it uh the concerns turn out to not be not be reality mm -hmm. so yes it is possible it's always possible possible with any, any, any medication, but the degree to which the results would have to be off here are, in, are astronomical. You would have to, even if regardless of the RCT, and by the way, with the non-RCT studies, the observational studies, there are studies that look at these individuals that are not from the trials. They're not from, the, they're not from Pfizer. They're not from Moderna. They find the same thing. It's the just, same thing, I mean, meaning... Look, we're, um, Meaning they're meaning that they're very efficacious, um, right. sometimes even more efficacious than they found in the trials, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, and they drastically improve um, morbidity and mortality. Right. So like at this point, you'd have to 
I, look, I mean, we're always, am I going to be open-minded if something new comes up? Of course, of course. Like there's some, there's some, if something, if new data comes on that it says reliable, absolutely. At this point, based on the data available, these things, they're, they're, these things are just relegated to fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And maybe that'll change in the future, but right now it's fairy tale level. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people have unfortunately been um, censored or silenced from doctors, virologists, epidemiologists, mm -hmm. um, political figures, um, you know, people in China uh, <laughs> to do with the lab um, origin, that yeah. kind of stuff, right? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of silencing going on, which again, enforces and encourages more of these uh, theories mm -hmm. and um, more doubts, uh, yeah. which is understandable, right? But, you know, there's a reason why. I agree with you there. Skeptical. This is where we agree. Yeah, yeah, this is where we agree, because I think I think that. So just to be clear, I think that, yes, it is happening where people are being silenced. And I understand why they're being silenced, because it's such a health um, hazard um, to uh, to stop people from getting this vaccine. However, um, well. I think the best approach. Yeah, yeah, I think the best I think the best approach. Well, that well, it is. a Well, it's. it's it's objective that it is a health hazard to stop people from getting inspecting. That's not subjective. But the, the, my view, my subjective view is that I think it's probably going to be better to not censor them. And instead of censoring them, what we really need is we need people who actually are familiar with the research and how research is done. Yeah. And we need them to debate these people. We need yeah. to, to, and that's what I do. I debate, I debate anti-vaxxers and I stomp them. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not just trying to be like a, yeah, like, I mean, here's like, and by the way, for any of your viewers, if anyone wants to debate me on, on this topic, have at it. You, yeah, preferably a, a doctor or, or someone qualified. <laughs> yeah, no, bring, bring them on. Um, yeah. I, I'll, I'll debate any doctor you want. I'll debate whoever, whoever wants to step up to the plate. Happy to debate them, happy to stop them. Because yeah. that's what we need rather than a sense of them. What we need is people who are informed about this to debate them in a public format so that they can look like a clown when they bring their anti-vax nonsense to someone who actually is familiar with their arguments and knows why they're nonsense. Okay. Okay. That's very confident. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. look, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not hard to be confident when you have so much of the reality on your side and the other side is at the level of a conspiracy theory. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, when it comes down to conspiracy theories, like there is always going to be a lot of them. However, there's always the conspiracy theories that are going to be proven to be true in the end. Like, for example, I personally believe that it will be proven if, you know, it's allowed to that, you know, the, the, the virus leaked from a lab. Like, I believe that that will happen for sure um, eventually. But that's been, you know, something that's been censored and banned. It's been, you know, people have been deleted from social media for saying that, for raising questions, for having people who work in these facilities who are from China um, and have, you know, a lot of good. And real quick, when I say people. when I say conspiracy theory, I'm not just talking about I'm not I'm talking about the type of conspiracy theory that a person with a tinfoil hat would say, right? <laughs> I'm talking about right. I'm talking about the person with a tinfoil hat that said they saw the UFO last night. Right. I'm not talking about, you know, like some kind of. What if the Pentagon? What, what if the Pentagon to, says the UFOs are real? <laughs> look, if they then they then they have to provide evidence. Same 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 standard as I hold everyone. To. If you right. want to say something, provide evidence. Doesn't matter what the organization is. Sure. So that's the kind of conspiracy theory I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like some kind of communist regime or trying to hide. You have to be convinced by the evidence, evidence though. Yeah, yeah, of course. I have to be convinced by the evidence, just yeah. like anything else. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that it's actually true, even if you're convinced of the evidence they provide. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's actual. No, it doesn't. No, nothing's per nothing's perfect, but that's but logic and reason and, and, and empirical evidence is the best tools that we have to go by. What is your thoughts on mandatory vaccines, mandatory vaccination for COVID? My thoughts on that. OK, so that's a complicated ethical topic. So. So I. It, it, it depends. Like if there is, look, at some point, it depends on what the facts of the, of the situation are. So it, let's just say hypothetically, um, you know, there's, you know, there's a certain amount of in, extra individuals that are going to die if you mandate vaccines compared to non-mandating vaccines. Mm. At some threshold, I'm going to say, yes, you should mandate vaccines. If like you scale up the amount of deaths on the other side, um, 
if the skeleton mounted deaths who are going if these individuals would die if you uh, d did not mandate vaccines compared to if you did mandate vaccines, at some thresholds of death, I'm going to say, yes, you should mandate vaccines. Of course, not to those who are allergic or et cetera, or will have some type of, we believe will have some type of reaction. Yeah. But I mean, to, to at the some point, I'm going to say yes. To our yeah, current numbers. To the current, I, to our current numbers. Um, Let's say it's a, yeah. I don't know. 0.3 mortality rate or something like that, or yeah. 1%. Zero, well, average average total is going to be around 0 0.5. But but yeah, um, I think so. I, I have to think about it a little more, but I, I, I lean towards mandatory, yeah. The way I see it is that I believe that these shots are potentially going to be you know more, um, not dangerous, but they're going to have more likelihood of, of some sort of side effects, potentially long-term that we have no idea about. Um, so, you know, and just because of that, just because of the reasoning behind not having the long term data, not understanding, um, you know, the, the, the effects of the, the shots long term and the complications, that is, you know, for me personally, enough reason not to mandate or force people to take something that they're personally unsure of. And even if their doctors or the health organizations say it is safe, if the data is missing, you know, it's you know, likely, you know, it's it's in, in your rights to decide, in my opinion, whether or not you want to take that, you know, risk, if you believe it is a risk. Now, even if you... Again, why is the, why is that concern? Why is the long-term concern there for the vaccine, but not there for COVID? Well, you know, people prefer to, you know, a lot of people, I think vegans as well, prefer to, you know, rely on their immune system and that kind of stuff, right? You've heard that a lot throughout the pandemic. People want to you know, be out That's in the sunshine, crazy. have enough vitamin D, yeah. um, you know, boost their immune systems and naturally through nutrition, lifestyle methods. And they want to take that risk with COVID, but they don't want to take that risk with a pharmaceutical because they're against maybe the ethical methods of the pharmaceutical industries. Maybe they've seen uh, what these pharmaceutical industries have done in the past, what kind of... Uh, I, I just want to see if there's a good argument. I just want to see if there's a good argument to be concerned about long-term effects of a vaccine, but not long-term effects of COVID, especially since we're having all these all these longer-term effects come up with COVID, but not, with the, not, not nearly as much with the vaccine. A more developed, um, you know, uh, immunity to the the strain or the virus as well is a reason why a lot of people. So, so, so I, I'm actually not convinced of that. Um, I'm actually, I think it might be the, it may be the opposite. Um, I think so. Now, I, I know that it's not antibodies is not just the end all be all, but I can tell you that people who get the vaccine have way higher on it uh, because I, I I'm actually involved in a research project that looks at this. People who get vaccines are have generally higher antibody levels against uh, COVID than those who have gotten COVID. Um, they tend to have the antibodies on the lower side. Now, I know it's not all about antibodies, it's about T cell mediated function, but T cell mediated function is enhanced by the vaccine as well. So I'm not sure it's the case that you have better immunity to COVID. Actually, if I had to gun to the head, if I had to pick one, I think you actually have worse immunity getting it naturally than with the vaccine. But they're not okay. mutually exclusive. Me personally, I had COVID, I had COVID, and I also got the vaccine. And my antibodies for, against COVID are off the charts now. You had COVID naturally, and then you got the vaccine on top of it? Yep. I, I had COVID naturally, and I got the vaccine on top of it. Just to increase your antibody count? And uh, yeah, to, well, I well, and because you're a doctor, is, uh, it's like it's effectively a doctor. Have, yeah, but the but to but my antibody counts went after I got COVID was actually on the lower side. The antibodies against and and I was I had a real case of it. I was out for ten days. Um, it was not fun. We got to get you out in the sun. But <laughs> yeah, that was the yeah the sun. If you just have the sunlight, then you. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I know your meaning, but the point being is that after, so after I got the vaccine, my antibody levels just shot up. Like there may be this synergistic effect. And I see that too. A lot of people get COVID and get the vaccine. They really have very high antibody levels against, against COVID. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced that based and on the data I've seen that. What about the cases more, where people get reinfected after vaccination, for example? There are cases like there are also cases who people get reinfected after after COVID. Um, there are breakthrough cases on both. Well, based on PCR tests, right? They're very rare. 
Yeah, based on PCR tests. They're very, they're rare, very rare, but they happen. They happen in both cases. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm not convinced that a breakthrough case is more likely if you get natural immunity versus if you get synthetic immunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I, I, I do understand and I do um, support people's skepticism uh, when it comes down to all these, you know, political affiliations and, and you know, industrial uh, motivations and that kind of stuff. I completely understand. Just like, you know, in, in the vegan community, people are very skeptical towards the dairy industry, the meat industry, um, funding, nutrition science, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, so I understand. John, the problem is not the skepticism. That's not my problem. The problem is not, I don't have a problem with people being skeptical. I have a problem with people applying their skepticism inconsistently. And that's what I see. And that's what I see in uh, a lot of times happening. Okay. They have a standard of skepticism that are they're applying to the vaccine that is incredibly high. And then when it comes to everything else, their standard of skepticism is just lower. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what justifies the higher level of skepticism from an epistemic standpoint in the vaccine, but not from every other thing. That's the issue. The issue, I'm, I'm happy with people being skeptical. Right. What, I, what I think is really weird and cringy is when people max out the skepticism to a ridiculous level just in one area specifically. Yeah, I can agree. And that tells me people are just acting like ideologues. Right. Yeah, I, I can fully get that. But since you support skepticism or you think it's a natural thing or, you know, something that mm -hmm. people, you know, would have, wouldn't you be in favor of people making their own minds up in terms of who, um, if they want to get a vaccine or not in order to, you know, that depends. Okay. Yeah, that depends on what the, that depends on what's going to happen. If, if, look, all, all things being equal, I would love that. All things being equal, I want people to be able to make their own choice. Now, when it happens where there's, enough bodies on the other end of the to under other end of the coin when you let people make their own decision at some point i'm going to say no you know what i don't care about your own decision right these these amounts of bodies are going to be more worth more than your decision um now yeah. that's going to be true for driving that's going to be true for everything now i don't think driving reaches that level i don't think smoking reaches that level but if it did if it did reach that level of smoking, for example, if, if smoke was able to replicate in other people's lungs and then pass from one lung to another in an exponential fashion, and then all these people were dying because some idiot just decided that it was their personal choice and freedom to smoke, I would tell them I don't care. You know what? I don't care. You, you want your choice? Guess what? It's not worth the rest of the people dying for it. Mm -hmm. Right. But at this point right now, with let's say a 0.5% yeah. mortality rate, what is your stance on mandatory vaccination? Yeah, I think that's higher. I think that's higher than um, it's it's higher than car crashes. It's higher than smoking. It's higher than all these other things. Um, yeah, I, now I in, in, in the short term, term, but not in the long term, right? People are going to be driving oh, their cars to the rest. Know. We don't know in the long term. Maybe in the long term, when when it goes down, we can we can make the choice again. Maybe in the long term, if it goes look, you could always change the policy. Right. Well, it's too late so if you've already had the vaccine, market. right? <laughs> Well, no, you could always, no, I'm saying you could change it for like future children and whatnot. Like it's not too late. There are going to be individuals sure. who are not going to get it. But the point is that even, in, yeah, in the short term, um, well, we don't know what's going to happen long term. It could be worse in the long term. Who knows? There could be another variant that comes out. I don't know. Neither do you. Neither does anyone. Mm -hmm. But the point is like the principle is the same. The principle is just that at a certain point, and that point is different for different people, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, your freedoms are not worth other people's graves, okay? Other people being put in graves. They're just not. I'm sorry. Um, and I would tell them to like, okay, I hear you. Too bad. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, you know, I, I, I would agree with you 100%. If the death, if the mortality rate was a lot higher, if this was something that was going to be around forever, the data was there. Yeah, for sure. Have you seen the, um, any information or studies? Um, where the injection, the, the spike protein ends up being created in many other places rather than only in the area of the injection, the muscle tissue and the shoulder, for example. For like, in terms of, for, for like months follow up? No, I have never seen yeah. anything like that. Oh, you um, haven't? Okay. Yeah, I've, I haven't seen that. I, ha I haven't seen for like months after, no. Okay. And, and even if it's, you know, a couple of days, weeks or something like that, do you think there is no... Oh, I'm um, sure it's there yet? in a day. I'm sure it's there in a couple yeah. of days. But what are the, um, why do the you whole, think that's That's not the whole point. Right. And the whole point, yeah, we, 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 but, you know, if, if 
it ends up in the brain or you know your your bone marrow over oh no 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 i haven't seen no no bone no i haven't seen anything like that okay yeah i haven't I mean, seen yeah. it in the brain or the bone marrow or anything like that yeah, yeah. Really haven't. I've but seen by the way i just have yeah. to mention again yeah <laughs> Yeah, it, look, having but but what I have seen, even if look, even if there are, you know, you do find a, a, some some spike proteins in these different tissues. With COVID, you have the whole virus there. Mm-hmm. You have the whole viron. That's not oh. just the spike protein. You have the whole virus. Mm-hmm. So like whatever amount of concern, and you have it. Not not only do you have it, you have the whole virus there seven months plus after you got it. Mm-hmm. Right. We're not just talking about a couple of days. Right. So like whatever concern we may have, and I'd be interested in seeing the, the proteins, whatever concern we may have, I have what I haven't seen is I haven't seen a the spike proteins there months after and mm-hmm. B, I haven't seen a whole virus there after. But I guess what? You see that with COVID. Right. Which you can still get after the injection. <laughs> Potentially. But it, incredibly okay john that's like so okay the, you know the odds of breakthrough cases like that yeah well you're, you're talking about I, less than like a tenth of one percent it's just yeah well you know it, it was on, incredibly it, it was on the news somewhere um that was uh a a town or a or a city in in the uk where uh most of the deaths and cases were from people who were vaccinated and that's not scientific data, but it's something to, to look into as well. I, I, I would, I would love to take a look at that I because a lot of times when they cool. look, every time I look at one of these things, it turns out to be nonsense, but I, I, I'm happy to take a look at it. My final question, when it comes to diagnosing COVID, do you think there is any chance um, that the PCR test uh, may be ineffective? It depends what you mean by ineffective. So in tests, you in, in terms to, uh, of figuring it. out, not finding, you know, the viral matter in itself, but uh, determining whether or not a person is uh, infectious. So that also depends in terms of what you mean by by uh, 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 effective. So it would in, in, every test is something called a right. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. But determining whether you're infectious is always infectious is not like a binary thing. Like it's a, it's a probability scale of transmission. Right. So it's a function of your, the viral load. So if you have a higher viral load, uh, particularly in the nasal area, then you're going to have a higher rate of transmitting COVID to other people. By the way, new data has come out showing that the vaccines actually reduce transmission rates by over by 50% or more because even when you do get uh, acquire the virus, even if you don't get COVID and have it, you have less viral load. Mm-hmm. So whether you're transmissible or not, whether you're whether you're infectious or not, isn't yes or a yes or no answer. It's a percentage. What percentage are you likely to transmit this virus to someone else? Mm-hmm. It's the scale. Now, that's just the point in terms of PCR testing. It's just going to look at. Um, it, you're going to have to have some type of test that looks at a viral load to do that. That's going to be a much more expensive test. I'm not sure if we have anything like that, um, mm-hmm. rather than some just wrestle of saying you have it or you, you don't have it. I don't know if we have a test that looks at an infectivity, but what we can do is there's been studies looking at rates of the transmission, and they find that they're lower by sometimes over 50% right. when you do get the vaccine compared to when you don't. Yeah, well, I, I've seen. Uh, I think it was a study comparing the um, um, uh, the CT or the yeah the the, the cycles to the infectious. Right. So you know the 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 lower the cycles, um, the, the more infectious you're going to be. The higher the cycles used, the less infectious you'll be because you know you have a very small amount of it in your system. Um, but every everyone's being tested at you know 30, 35 cycles, so um, the data is kind of hard to. To sort out there, maybe you know to be set on the it's safe. It's always part. a balance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's always a balance between something called sensitivity and specificity. Mm-hmm. So the test, so it's a, that's that's the topic for a different time. But right. the point is, that anytime you're designing a test, you have to balance out the um, your uh, your your fault. You're going to have some false positives and false negatives. You're going to have to balance them out. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, it's going to come down into sensitivity and specificity. That's a whole different complicated discussion. Yeah. But the point is, at the end of the day, getting the vaccine mess makes you less infectious. Mm-hmm.